something that we read in, in, uh, in the Tanya, which is kind of appropriate to talk about it tonight. How are we supposed to be inspired when things are not going well? I mean, it's a question everybody faces or deals with sooner or later, unfortunately sooner than later. What is the right answer? This is not therapeutic. This is not how to fix damage after the damage happens. This is uh, preventative. What healthy attitude can we have that will prevent us from getting discouraged, disheartened, depressed? What do we need to know about the world so that we can handle what's going on in the world? The first thing we need to know is we didn't mess up the world. The world is the lowest of all creations. That's the world we're in. Adam and Eve understood that if they stay in the Garden of Eden, they're not going to accomplish anything. Because the Garden of Eden is not the lowest world that needs our attention and our repair. It's this world outside of the Garden of Eden that is the lowest of all of God's creations, and we are here to fix it, to elevate it, to refine it, and to turn the lowest world into the highest and most godly of all creation. Pretty ambitious plan. But we were given a lot of tools with which to do it. The Torah, mitzvahs, customs, all geared to improve the world. Anything we do to improve life in this world is a mitzvah. Because that's what we're here for. And in that, all human beings are included. Every single human being, all eight billion of us, every one of them is necessary for the perfection of this world. And that's in addition to all those souls who were reincarnated before us. <laughs> so it's been a lot of people for all of history. And we've made a big difference. The world is so much better today than it ever was. And it just needs a few finishing touches. So the first thing is, life is not easy in this, on this planet. Not because we mess up. Not because we're weak. Not because we did anything wrong and we're guilty of some kind of a crime, but because it is the lowest world. In the lowest world, there is mortality. Adam and Eve were told, if you eat from the tree, you're going to end up in a world of mortality. This world. Along with the mortality, there's also uh, immorality which means that there is illness. We didn't create that. We're here to fix it. So a big part of our guilt can be dispensed with. We are not guilty of ruining the world. In the secular thinking, the attitude or the belief is that without human beings, the world would be so much better. We wouldn't pollute, we wouldn't corrupt, we wouldn't destroy. As if nature is good. Nature is not good. Nature destroys itself. Animals eat each other. 
fish swallow each other. It is not a nice world. Only goodness in the world is the goodness we bring. Okay, so a lot of the guilt we can get rid of. <clears throat> Every person in their own life has to distinguish between what am I responsible for and what is simply the task at hand where you have to engage the ugliness and the pain of the world and fix it. We carry too much guilt. What is our freedom of choice? It's not all we think it is. Where do we have freedom of choice? What choices do you have to feel responsible for? The only area in which we have free choice is in our morality. We are free to make moral decisions. That's all. Everything else is preordained. Like, for example, being born. That's not your choice. And it's a big event in your life. <laughs> and you have no choice. Being born to your parents rather than somebody else's parents, that's a big thing. No choice. Male or female, contrary to popular opinion, there is no choice. It's given. You're not asked. Jew or non-Jew, you're not asked. To live in this generation versus another time in history, you're not asked. Even where you move, <clears throat> the house you buy, the job you choose, it's not free choice. I was talking to this woman who says, you know, I can marry anybody and it's hard to make a choice. That you could marry anybody? Let's say there are four billion men in the world and you can marry any one of them? Well, hypothetically, first you have to meet them. You're not going to meet four billion men. So let's eliminate at least seven billion. <laughs> now we're down to a mere billion. Of those billion, When you, when you finish making the, uh, you know, working the numbers, it basically comes down to two. And one of them you don't like so much. So, really, where's the freedom of choice? The house you buy, the job you get, the uh, clothes you buy, it's not free choice. You walk into a shoe store, you can buy any shoe you want? No, you can't. It's got to be your size. It's got to be your style. Why do you like brown? That was not a choice. That's just the way you are. Can't explain it. And you really don't have an option. The food you eat, is it really free choice? You can go into a restaurant, eat anything you want? Not really. So we are so pre-programmed in almost everything. Where do we have free choice? In our morality. <clears throat> Meaning, our response to God. There we have free choice. So the only real freedom God gives us is to love him or to hate him. And that makes perfect sense because if choices have to be made, shouldn't he make the choice? He makes better choices. So, you know, if it was up to us, so don't, don't, don't make us make decisions. You make the decision. Like, which house should I buy? Which town should I live in? Which job should I? Tell me. It'll be much better if you tell me. 
The only reason we have freedom of choice in our response to him is because he has no choice but to give us freedom of choice. Because it works like this. God wants a relationship with us. A real relationship. Not like with the angels. The angels have no opinion. They have no freedom of choice. They're overwhelmed by God's holiness and they just do whatever he says. That's not a relationship. To have a relationship means God wants to give us his love and he wants to get our love. So why doesn't he just make us love him? <laughs> if, if he makes us love him, he's just loving himself. Then it's not my love. If he wants my love, he has to allow me the freedom to hate him. Because if I can't hate him, then it's not my love. He's just loving himself. Like with the angels. So the only area in which God must give us freedom of choice is if he wants our love. We do have freedom of choice, which means he does want our love. That tells us something about marriage. The same rule applies to marriage. If your wife wants to make all the decisions, fine. Maybe she's better at it. You want to make all the decisions? Your wife says, fine, go ahead, make all the decisions. You're good at it. There's only one thing where you have to have freedom of choice. <clears throat> you want me to love you? Or do you want to make me love you? because you love yourself. So if you want my love, I got to be free to love or not to love. That makes it intimate. When you are free to love or not love, then when you love, it is intimate, not mechanical, not automatic, not pre-programmed. Intimate. So we know that God wants an intimate relationship with us. <clears throat> now, if you follow the different eras, the different periods in history, what has changed and what is changing is how we relate to God and how God relates to us. In the beginning, there was no way that a human being could reach out to God. God had to reach out to the people. God creates Adam and Eve and tells them what to do. Did they believe in God? Did they love God? Did they understand God? Well, whatever he told them, that's what they knew. What he didn't tell them, they didn't know. In other words, the relationship came completely from him. There was nothing a human being could do to approach God, to get closer to God. And that's why there was so much evil. Except for the individual like Noah and his family. When Avraham came along, Something changed. The relationship between the human and God became a little more personal. Avraham recognized God on his own. That was a huge, major achievement. Which means that God had made himself more available so that even a human being can recognize the existence of a creator. Not just believe it, but recognize it. Belief comes when God 
reveals himself. Recognition comes on your own effort. Then God comes down to Mount Sinai in the times of, of Moshe Rabbeinu, and he reveals his commandments, his Torah, his instructions, his teachings. The period that we are in today, if you break history into segments, the segment we are in today began 300 years ago. This is our time now. 300 years ago, the Baal Shem Tev changed the world because the relationship with God was ready for a giant step forward. And we are benefiting from that. It makes sense that we should celebrate this evening, the day that the first Chabad Rebbe came out of czarist imprisonment, because the czar said, I'm convinced that the teachings of Hasidus is not uh, political, it's not revolutionary, you're not trying to depose the, the, uh, the, the czar, and you are free to teach your teachings. That was a reflection of what was going on in heaven. In heaven, there was a debate. The Rebbe was teaching too much. He was revealing too many secrets that were kept private and personal for 3,000 years. On this day, when the Tsar said, no, the teachings are fine. That's because in heaven it was decided that the time has come. Go ahead, teach it. Reveal it all. God is now more available than before. The result is this. We are not like our grandparents. We're not like our great-grandparents. Every Jew in the world will tell you, am I a good Jew? Not like my Zaidi. Not like my Bubby. I mean, they were great. Everybody has a great rabbi in their family. We're not great. We're not great. We're incredible, but we're not great. So what happened? With each generation moving away from Mount Sinai, the memory gets dimmer. We go down in our abilities, in our understanding, in our... So we're not like our grandparents. But at the same time, God gets closer. The relationship with God is maturing. We started off just knowing that he exists like a baby knows that his mother exists because she nurses him. No idea what a mother is, who the mother is, but that there's a mother, yeah, everybody knows, even infants. You get a little older and you start wondering, who is this woman? And does she really love me? <laughs> That's when you start developing issues. And then you realize, yes, yes, she loves you. Now the question is, do I love her? Or am I just a baby dependent on her? This is exactly what happened to the Jewish people in relationship with God. So when we read in the Torah, the Jews rebelled, and they demanded, and they questioned, and where's the beef, where's the water, why'd you take us, why are you bringing us? This is adolescence. We're, we're feeling our way in the relationship. So you took us out of Egypt. Wow, you really like us. And then we're stuck by the sea. You hate us. That is so typical. You gave me an ice cream. You're such a good mother. But you won't give me another one. You're the worst mother in the world. And we bounce back and forth like this. But we are maturing. We don't have the talents of past generations. We're not giants in Torah. 
We're not giants in devotion, self-sacrifice. No. We're quite spoiled. But at the same time, as we are losing talents, God is making himself more available. Which means you don't need the talent. Like the first 30, 40 years of a marriage, you got to have some talent. You got to work the relationship. After 50 years of marriage, you don't have to do anything. You're just bonded. You're just inseparable. Are you good at it? <laughs> good at what? It's done. We are bonded. When Mashiach comes, one of the first things that's going to change is that we won't have to be told to do a mitzvah, any mitzvah. Today we call it commandments, which is a bad word anyway. And it's not, it's not, a, not a good translation. The Ten Commandments. What is it called in Hebrew? Hmm? Aseris had Dibros, the Ten Statements. How did that become commandments? I don't know, that sounds good in English. Commandment. Better behave yourself. Sounds very authoritative, you know, intimidating. But that's not what it says. It's not a commandment because we have a relationship with God and he wants it to be an intimate relationship. An intimate relationship does not include commandments. Like, what does your wife command? Or when have you, what have you commanded your wife to do for dinner? The, the word is so inappropriate. It's so wrong. So there, there are ten statements. God gathered us at Mount Sinai and said things. told us what he wants. Why did he have to tell us what he wants? Because how we're supposed to know. Like in a marriage, talk. Say what you want. Don't, don't, don't have your spouse guessing. But after 30, 40 years of marriage, you can stop talking. I know, I know. We know each other better than we know ourselves. It's like Jackie Mason's joke. Every Jewish husband asks his wife, do I like that? <laughs> you know better what I like. Hey, that's a marriage. So when Mashiach comes, God won't tell us what he wants. <clears throat> he won't have to. So if you put on tefillin, it's not because you're told. It's because you know he wants it. That's a mature relationship. So we are very close to that state of being, to that level of relationship. So the Rebbe said, you know, it seems like very simple, practical. The Rebbe said, go out on the streets, stop a Jew, stop a man, ask him if he's Jewish. If he is, offer him a pair of tefillin. Well, what if he's not religious? So what? What if he doesn't believe in God? So what? Give him the tefillin. Say, wait a minute, this doesn't make any sense. A generation ago, this would never happen. No one could, re no one could relate to it. Why would you ask a non-religious person to put on tefillin? Why would you ask somebody who doesn't believe in God to do a mitzvah? First, you have to believe. Then you have to be committed. Then you have to be orthodox or from or fanatical. <laughs> Something. You got to be learned. You got to go to yeshiva. Then you'll put on tefillin. 
So this is what has been happening now for so many years. Young yeshiva boys go out in the street with a truck and they stop people and say, excuse me, are you Jewish? If the man says yes, they say, would you like to put on tefillin? The man says, I'm not religious. The boy says, it only takes five minutes. Did you not hear what I said? I'm not religious. Yeah, but it's a very big mitzvah. <laughs> We're not communicating. I'm not religious, so I don't do that. I'm sure you do that because you're religious. You see the logic here? <laughs> and, and the boy says, the Rebbe said that it's very good for all... They're not communicating at all. But the boy is rolling up the guy's sleeve. I don't know if you've had this experience. He, they're arguing, and as they're arguing, he's rolling up the sleeve, and he's got the tefillin out, and he says, say, Baruch, Baruch. No, I really shouldn't do this. I'm not religious. Where is the breakdown here? Why are they not communicating? Because the boy was raised by the Rebbe. And the Rebbe said, serving God has nothing to do with how religious you are. It has to do with what God wants. He wants Tvilin. You put on Tvilin. So to the boy, he says, are you Jewish? You said yes. Okay, so here you're Tvilin. And the guy says, but I'm not religious. And the boy is thinking, I'm not here to discuss religion. I asked you if you're Jewish, you said yes. Well, if you're Jewish, here are your tefillin. This would never work. This would never happen a generation ago. It just wasn't that way. You were either religious or you weren't. They tell this incredible story. When the Rebbe was four years old, He was sitting with his mother on a hot summer day and wearing a big yarmulke. He had a big head. A man came over to him, a Jewish man who had become a communist or whatever. He comes over to him and he says, in Yiddish, he says, Ingele, it's so hot. That yarmulke must be so uncomfortable. Take it off. The Rebbe said, you're not allowed. The man said, don't worry. The sin will be on my account. And this four-year-old child said, what's the difference? Who does the sin? That is revolutionary. What difference does it make who does the sin? It makes all the difference in the world. It will determine who goes to hell. Or who doesn't go to heaven. That was the thinking a generation ago. hundred years ago. What's the difference who does the sin? Are you kidding? Why is it no difference? Because the question is, what does God want? It's not about my being religious. So imagine God himself is standing there and you ask a guy to put on tefillin and the guy says, sorry, I don't believe in God. God is right here. I don't care whether you believe in him, but on the throne. God has become so real, so down to earth. You don't have to believe. You don't have to study. You don't have to become a chacham. You don't have to do anything. God is real. Where do we see that God is real? 
You know about this guy who sued his parents? Yeah, you know? 27-year-old guy. Took his parents to court. He wants them to pay all his bills for the rest of his life. Why? Because they gave birth to him without his consent. Sadly, he lost the case. He actually went to court. <laughs> I think the reason he lost the case is because his parents said, we didn't ask to be born either. We're all in the same boat. But look, listen to the argument. I was born without my consent, so how did I become responsible to pay bills? Doesn't that make sense? I have to go to school, I have to get good grades, get into a good college, get a good job, make a lot of money, and pay the bills. Excuse me. I never signed up for this. I never agreed to this. You decided to, have, to, to give birth to me, and, and I owe you? You gave birth to me, you pay the bills. Makes a lot of sense. You can't invite me to a very expensive restaurant and then tell me to pay. Doesn't that make sense? And not only with secular things like making a living and getting a job and paying the bills. How about commandments? You must keep kosher. You must keep Shabbat. You must go to the mikveh. You must come to shul. You must give tzedakah. Excuse me? I must? Did anybody ask me? It's a very good question. And you never heard that until recently. Now, every teenager is saying that. Kids are saying it. I have to clean up the room. I didn't ask to be born. What is this? What's going on? What is this phenomenon here? They're not depressed. Don't, don't put them on pills. He's not a depressed kid. He's a smart kid. So as long as life is okay, he's fine with it. But he's wondering. I never signed up. I never agreed. I never, I never made a contract. And I have to clean up the room? How did that happen? It's a good question. In other words, we're really getting down to the most fundamental basic question. Why are we here? Don't tell me how to live. Tell me why I'm living. Nobody ever asked that question except big philosophers have nothing better to do. Part of it is because of affluence. People in third world countries are too busy. They don't have time to think. So they don't ask questions. But when you're comfortable and you have a little free time, you start to wonder. God is so real now because without God, there is no answer to life itself. Because bottom line, I don't need this. Do I need to be here? I don't mean here in the room. I mean, do I need to be born? Do I need to have a life? Has anyone who wasn't born ever complained? Hey, how come I'm not born? No, no one ever complains like that. So wait a minute. If I don't need this, then what is it all about? If I'm not here because of my need, then it must be my parents' need. But they say they don't need it either. Nobody asked them.
what is happening is that the most simple, basic question that everybody has, has only one answer. There's only one answer. Unavoidable. We are not here because we need. We are here because we are needed. And so whoever created us has a need. There's no other answer. There's no other explanation. And now it turns out, this is what the Torah has been telling us all along. And we turned it into a religion. It's not a religion. It's what God needs from his creation. Does it make sense that God needs? Or why? He created the whole world and doesn't need it? <laughs> of course. He created the world with a purpose. So here's the most simple, I'm going to end with this, the most simple calculation. You look at a stone in the street. What is that? What, what, what is a stone? A stone basically announces its existence, right? I am. I exist. Which means I was created. <laughs> if there's a creation, and you know there is because you just saw a stone, if there's a creation, there's a creator. If there's a creator, there's a reason, a purpose. If there's a purpose, then there's a will. We know God said, let there be light. Is that how it all began? No. Before he said it, he had a plan. Before he had a plan, he had a will. And before he had a will to create, he felt a pleasure in creating. So now what do we know about God? Before there was anything, God saw a pleasure in having us. Relationship with us. This is not religion. This is not philosophy. It's not theology. Look at a stone, and the stone will tell you. The stone will shout. Don't you get it? I was created. Figure it out. Do the math. I was created. Which means there's a creator, which means there's a plan, which means there's a desire. Find out. If God desires you, how are you going to respond to that? That's why when God came to the Jewish people and said, I have a Torah, are you interested? We didn't ask. What do you want? What kind of commandments? What are we supposed to do? We said yes. We heard God proposing to us. We didn't hear the word commandment. We heard God say, I have. And we said, oh yeah. Whatever it is you have, we want it. That's a relationship. So on the one hand, we are not like our grandparents. We're not like Rabbi Akiva. We're not like Rambam. We're not the Baal Shem Tov. We're pretty low on the totem pole. But God is closer to us than ever. Because the whole idea is to bring God down to earth. And we are pretty earthy. So we really are very, very fortunate to be living at this particular time. 
the world is so good that the bad people are panicking. Evil itself is panicking. The angel of death is panicking because it's all over. The goodness is overwhelming the evil. Don't believe the news. It's fake news. Come on, you know it's fake news. If they would at least report something good once a month. No, nothing good ever happens. You know that's fake. There's so much more good going on than ever. Anti-Semitism, there is so little anti-Semitism compared to 30 years ago. So, what will it take to tilt the scales in favor of the Creator? One more mitzvah? One more good thought? One more encouraging, optimistic word? Yeah. And we should all ask God, if all you need is one more mitzvah, can it be mine? I would like to be the one who puts that finishing touch on the universe, on creation, on everything. Because it does take one more mitzvah. And you're allowed to be selfish about this. I want it to be my mitzvah. It's fine. It's a good way to think. This all began for this new period of, of the relationship with God, with the Baal Shem Tev, and developed by the Tanya, by the Alter Rebbe. Since then, it's been seven generations of improvement. And we now have people all over the world. No exaggeration. We were given the internet. Not, not an accident of history. We are ready to share our wisdom with the entire world, and for that we need a tool. So God gave us the internet. So when we have these conversations online, half the people who tune in are not Jewish. Many of them are from Africa hardly speak English. They have to go a long distance to get to where there is internet available. And they just want to know. They just want to know. Is this right? Is that? The desire, the hunger, and without philosophy, without, they're not religious people. Thank God. They just want to know. This is such a good time. Such an exciting time. You know, uh, some popular celebrities who have said some anti-Semitic things. And some people are panicking. I was so proud. Somebody interviewed Chabad rabbis. The, the convention was recently in, in, in Brooklyn. Separately, one did not know of the other. This guy walked around with a tape recorder and he interviewed six different rabbis from different parts of the world. What do you think about what what's his name said? I was so proud of the consistent, proper, and, and optimistic response. Every one of them said, did he really say that? Tell him to come over to Chabad house. We'll have a few drinks, we'll have some coffee, we'll talk, we'll work it out. 
He's, he's just confused. He's mistaken. He's misled. Bring him over to Chabad house. Roman Shliach from Russia said, that's what he said? Tell him to come see me. We'll have a little vodka. <laughs> that's so good. And it's so true. It's so true. We're not dealing with evil. We're dealing with confusion. Terrible confusion. Which in some ways is even scarier than evil. And if they're evil, shoot them. <laughs> we don't even know who's evil anymore. We're so confused. But Hasidus keeps us focused. It's a world that needs fixing. We've come a long way. All the heavy lifting was done by our ancestors because they had great talent. All we need to do is one more mitzvah, one more positive, optimistic, hopeful, faithful statement. And the evil will just surrender. What do you think? Yes? No? Questions? Yes? No? Yeah. This first of all, this is called for you. Very deep, very powerful. Thank you. <clears throat> when you said evil will surrender, if you deny God, he creates a moral and just society. But if you rely only on God and not fight evil, then you will win. Of course. Of course we have to fight evil. But you gotta know your enemy. You gotta know your enemy. If your enemy is out to kill you, how do you fight? Kill him first. But if the enemy is not out to kill you, the enemy just doesn't know what he's talking about. How do you fight that? Enlighten. Clarify. The darkness of today, the evil of today, is the absence of light. It's not the evil of the past. The evil of the past, you simply had to destroy it. It took a world war to destroy the evil. And how many lives were lost destroying that evil? I mean, that was evil. People have very strong memories. <laughs> no, but things have changed. It's not a matter of memory. The evil of today comes simply because there's no light. A quick example. You know, they have these riots. You know, riots break out and people are burning down this, the neighborhood and, you know, Minnesota. Most of the people doing that are young people. Today's young people, what diet, moral diet, were they raised with? Ask them if they know the Ten Commandments. They never even heard of the movie. They are raised with such poor nourishment. Violence and sex and gangs and drugs. And what else do they know? You see five teenagers standing in the street. What do you think they're talking about? What? Joseph and his brothers. <laughs> it is so sad. They know nothing. Nothing. On college campuses, they ask these students, who is the worst among all of these people? And they showed them five pictures of different people. And they all picked whatever... Somebody said, uh, I don't know, Churchill? He said, really? He was worse than Hitler? Yeah. Even though Hitler killed six million Jews? He did. 
This is college students. Are we dealing with evil people? Are we dealing with brainless? <laughs> so now, the problem with all the evil is they don't know. They have no idea. I was at a dinner, fundraising thing, crowded room. This woman comes up behind me, and in a shrill voice, she's about that big, she says, Rebbe, my son is marrying a non-Jewish woman. Talk to him. Let me talk to him. I turn around. The guy is standing there. Her son is standing. The whole room heard her. Everybody turns around. I felt so bad for the guy. It must be so embarrassing. But I looked at him and he, he wasn't embarrassed. So I said, you're marrying a non-Jewish woman? He says, yeah. I said, so you're going to be the Jew in the family? He says, yeah. I said, so if they have questions, you'll answer them. He says, yeah. I said, do you feel like you know enough to be able to answer the questions? He says, what is there to know? <laughs> what is there to know? I said, well, there are the five books of Moses, 60 volumes of Talmud, about a thousand customs. He said, oh, yes? It was so innocent. Had no idea. So I pushed it a little further. I said, you know what would be a great idea? You're not getting married for a few months. Go off to yeshiva. Cram a little bit. Learn so that you can answer the questions like a mensch. He says, that's a good idea. <laughs> Do you see what we're dealing with? In the olden days, his parents would have sat shiva for him. Why? He's not rebelling. He's not running away. He doesn't know. <laughs> well, this other student said to me, I'm converting to Christianity. I said, why? He said, they have such good books. I said, like what? He says, like Psalms. Isaiah. I said, those are good books. <laughs> but they're ours. <laughs> no idea. So yes, we have to fight. But what we're fighting is ignorance. And you don't fight ignorance with a gun. You fight it with a pair of tefillin. <laughs> with a few answers. With a few conversations. The world is so much better today. I hope you believe me on that one. Any other questions? Yeah. He said, hope is so good, but what do you think about what's going on in Ukraine and Russia? It's very evil. What's going on? Yes, what's going on with Russia and Ukraine is evil. But more than evil, it's crazy. What are they fighting over? What, what, what are they doing? It's crazy. Now, if you could speak to Putin, what would you say? What would you say to Putin? You're an evil man. He may be. What I would say to him is, you obviously want to be a hero. You think if you win the war with Ukraine, you're going to be a hero? Nobody will consider you a hero. The world is not interested in wars in winning and losing, nobody is interested. You want to be a hero? Make peace. 
and you will go down in history as a great man. The world has changed. He's, he's thinking of the old, you know, the old philosophy. You beat up everybody, you're a hero. No, you're not. Not in this world. So yeah, it's evil. But it's more crazy than evil. Yes. I, I didn't hear. Thank you for bringing that up. The sages say that they took a vote and it was unanimous. It is easier to never be born. Easier, not better. It's easier not to be born because you don't need any of this. But it's better to be born for what you are needed for. So here's, here's the final conclusion for our times. We are not needy, we are needed. That's your free choice. Choose. You want to live feeling needy, or do you want to live feeling needed? It turns out that the human condition demands being needed more than it demands being loved. If I'm not needed, love is not going to make up for it. Not needed but loved, mm, that's a gerbil. That's a puppy. Don't need it, but you love it. A human being cannot get comfortable being a puppy. I actually said this to a group of Protestants. And the minister was there. I said, we don't need love. We need to be needed. He said, well, you just shot our whole theology to pieces. Because it's all about love. God loves you and he loves you and he loves you. Yeah, does he need me? No. No deal. No deal. What the Torah says, God needs you. Even when he doesn't love you. And sometimes he don't love you. But he needs you. That is much healthier, much more real to life. We are needed creatures, not needy creatures. We are the solution, not the problem. Idea of the same thing, like picture God as this right, like all <clears throat> powerful, right being. How could He need anything? Right. Like I, that's the only time I get. To think yeah, about. that's the that's the argument I get the most. What do you mean God needs? He's perfect. There's something wrong with that thinking. You mean if I became perfect, then I wouldn't need you? Is that what perfect means? If I was really perfect, I wouldn't need anybody. That's not perfect. That's a monster. It's because God is perfect that he can actually want a relationship, not service. If you're not perfect, you need something. If you need something, it gets in the way. But if you don't need anything, you just want a relationship. Then you're perfect and not alone. Because there's nothing good about being perfect. Did you ever think of that? You're absolutely perfect. You can make your own eggs. You can fry an egg all by yourself. You can do laundry. 
You don't need to get married. You're perfect. What's good about that? What's good about it? God is perfect. Perfect. That's it. End of story. Dead end. If you're just perfect, the story is over. I'm perfect, I need nothing. End of story. If you came to God and said, how's everything? Perfect. Um, what are you doing tomorrow? Nothing. You looking forward to the future? No. It's, you're dead. God is a living God, not a dead perfection. So I don't know, we got this, this romance going with perfection. What's good about being perfect? What's good? Oh, it's very useful. If you can live by yourself on an island and take care of everything, oh, you're, you're a talented guy. What's good about it? Goodness doesn't begin until there's another. So to just say, oh, God is perfect. And, and that's it. No, it's not it. He was always perfect, yet he created a world. Take a hint. <laughs> Why would somebody perfect create a world? Because in addition to being perfect, He's also romantic. Yeah? How do you take people out of the world? The problem is, you can preach all the wonderful things that you have to do to Jewish people or to not non Jewish people who are not knowing. As you said before, about the person who is marrying a non Jew, he really doesn't know, he doesn't really understand. But how do you reach the people who are evil to help make the world a better world to be in? There are, there are some things we can try, but the good news is they're coming for help. They're asking for help. They know they have nothing going for themselves. They're desperate. And some of the violence comes from their desperation. So we got to come to them and say, why are you desperate? You need to know why you're here, I'll tell you. I guess all these people say, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take off some time and go find myself. Ask me, I know where you are. No, no, i got to get to know myself. Ask me. There's no mystery, I know you. You're petty, you're selfish, you're foolish. What else do you want to know? <laughs> what are you going to find out? What are you looking for? It's so frustrating. What you're looking for is, who needs me? Focus. The only question you have is, who needs me? Because somebody does. Maybe more than one somebody. And if you know who needs you, you have no further questions. Any further questions? <laughs> no. Let's all have lots of good news that doesn't make it to the news but it is very good, it's very real, it's very true. We are better people now after COVID than we were before. Yes or no? One more mitzvah. Want to do some Tanya? Want to do some Tanya? You want to do it? You want to do it? I should do it.
Just to quote some Tanya, officially, formally. The Rebbe quotes the Gemara, where it says that before your soul came into your body, before you were conceived, actually, an angel asked you to make a vow. And the vow is that you will be a tzaddik, you will not be a sinner. And even if the whole world tells you that you are a tzaddik, you should consider yourself like a sinner and continue to... There is a place in our soul where in a quiet moment, in that still, small voice, if we allow ourselves to hear what's going on inside, what would we hear? We would hear ourselves making the vow. And it would inspire us greatly to fulfill the vow. Which in simple language or psychological language means we all walk around with a vague memory of a voice in the back of our head. Our own voice. We swore that we would be good. So it's like trying to remember a song and you can't. It's right there. and, and Or you remember that you have an appointment, a very important appointment, and you don't remember with who. It drives you crazy. That's why Jews are neurotic. We have this voice telling us, do it, do it. Do what? What do you want? What you promise. And what did you promise? To serve him. To serve him. Because that's what you're needed for. It's such a relief when you finally remember the song that has been torturing you, where you remember who the appointment is with. Now you can say, hey, I don't want to go to that appointment. But the torture is over. So, Tanya set us on a path of sanity. Stop torturing yourself. Stop questioning yourself. Why am I here? What am I good at? Do you love me? Love me not. How do you like me now? What about now? What about? Don't do this. We are not the needy ones. We are here to serve. Tell me where. Tell me how. I'll do it. It's what I'm here for. And that's why you can stop somebody in the street and say, come put on Philip. You don't believe in God? That's fine. It's not about you. It's about him. You don't want to put on film? How about giving charity? No, not charity? How about lighting a Shabbos candle? No, not that one either? <laughs> How about honoring your parents? Come on, there's got to be one mitzvah you like. <laughs> there is something you can do for him any moment at any time. Don't torture yourself. It's, it's sanity. It's not religion. It's just plain sane. I didn't ask to be born. He needs me to be born. Well, then, I figure he'll probably take care of me because he needs me. So I'm not worried. How am I going to live? How am I going to survive? How am I going to pay the bills? It's his plan. You're important enough for him to create you. You're important enough for him to feed you. Stop worrying. 
just beautiful. It's just so sane and so simple. So make it a point of studying a little Tanya every day. Online, plenty of classes online. You have the Chabad house, you can come here, bother the rabbi. You'll find it so fascinating, even though it was written 200 years ago. It's more relevant today than ever. So do yourself a favor. Enjoy. Thank you so much, Rabbi Friedman, for most inspiring words.